Okay, so we are all good to go for the next 90 minutes. Mr. Anderson, you have the floor, sir. July 7th, 2015 through January 13th, 2017, Johns Hopkins missed a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome on seven different occasions when Maya was in for their care. We will prove that they misdiagnosed Maya's symptoms from October 7th through the end of the year, wrongfully accusing Beata and Jack Kowalski of child abuse and alleging and attempting to show that Maya had a mental disorder, that she was crazy, she was making it up. We'll prove that they realized their error pretty quickly and instead of apologizing, Saying we're sorry. Continue, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Judge. Upon realizing their error, for the next three and a half months, they took every step in the world to attempt to force the Kowalskis to agree with the wrongful diagnosis. Maya Kowalski was falsely imprisoned and battered. She was denied communication with her family. She was denied communication with the outside. She was told that her mother was crazy. She was told by social workers that one in particular, she would be her mother. She was put into a room and left for 42 hours with the commode just out of reach because the hospital wanted to prove that she could actually get up and walk. So they wanted her on video, this was a surveillance room, to get out of bed and then go over to the commode when nobody was watching. Instead, she defecated on herself. For 42 hours, she was kept in that room, denied access to anyone or anything under the false assertion that it was an EEG exam. Maya was repeatedly battered by nurses and social workers who were trying to prove that she did not have CRPS. Things were done such as coming in and patting her on her leg. They were hugging her against her will, took her down to the chapel, sat her on the lap of one named Kathy Beatty, who told her that she would be her mother. Her mother was, you know, crazy and that she needed a mother and that social worker would be there. Maya was kept from her family and friends. She was denied access to her priest. She had what they called religious artifacts such as holy water, uh, her prayer book, her rosaries taken from her on the belief that her mother was controlling her over religion. She was denied access to counsel, at least insofar as having the ability to actually meet with her attorney without people listening in at the door. All of her phone calls were monitored. 
Her iPad computer was taking out, take it, taken away because she was told she might be, this is a 10-year-old, cruising internet, uh, cruising internet sex sites. Maya was denied the comforts of her friends and her family throughout her stay there. On another occasion, again, to try to show that Maya did not have rather significant symptoms of CRPS, which you'll see are these small little red angry lesions that appear on different parts of the body, underneath the arm, along the arms, sometimes on the legs, sometimes on the back. And you'll see photos here in a moment. But in order to prove that she didn't have one, she was systematically stripped and photographed against her will and without any authorization from anyone, least of all her parents. They continued to accuse the Kowalskis, Jack and Beata, of being child abusers, even after the evidence, we believe you'll conclude, was overwhelming that she had CRPS. In fact, we will see whether at some point they even admit she had CRPS in this case. Yet they still, throughout this period of time, continue to accuse Beata of child abuse and Jack of child abuse, something called Munchausen by proxy, which means that you're intentionally trying to keep your child ill. It's usually a circumstance with a very small child where a mother will be like putting uh, something in a, an IV or things like that. And Maya, at this time, was 10 years old. There is no evidence whatsoever of much of my heart proxy. By January 13th, when Maya was finally left out of the hospital, unsurprisingly, this family was a wreck. Maya was not let out of the hospital even after her mother committed suicide on January 7th of 2017. Now the story with Beata Kowalski is a complex one, and I'll tell you about it in a moment, but we will prove that the continued allegations that she was crazy and that she was trying to harm her own children, both Kyle and Maya, and the systematic, the knowledge of the systematic abuse of her child in the hospital caused her, at the end, to lose completely and utterly her ability to control the maternal instinct, and that that outweighed the survival instinct. In the process, they caused Beata Kowalski her life, denied Jack a loving wife, denied both Kyle and Maya a loving, caring, and amazing mother. They caused just terrific and permanent psychological injury, as one may expect, a permanent aggravation, and we'll explain the medicine behind that, of the CRPS. Now, the CRPS didn't start with Johns Hopkins. It started about three or four days before Johns Hopkins. But the evidence will show that something that could have been a controllable, manageable disease was aggravated to the point where throughout periods in her life she will be incapacitated. And through all of it, she and her brother and her father will have post-traumatic issues and problems that will, frankly, uh, we'll get that into that in a moment. We've asked in this case for you to consider not only compute compensatory damages to try to make them whole for these terrible things that have happened to them, but also punitive damages to deter them, to punish them, and to deter this type of behavior in the future. So some of the evidence here will be directed towards that. So that's the overview of what we're trying to do. Now, how are we going to do it? First, you understand that we have 
really four plaintiffs here. We have Maya Kowalski right here. We have Kyle Kowalski, and we have Jack Kowalski. And Jack's also the parent and guardian of both of them, right? So the claims go through him. And then he has independent actions himself. And he's also appearing for the estate of his deceased wife, Bia. And each of them have causes of action, some of them combined. Now, this historic case has been going on. Uh, it was filed in October 2018. I tell you this because the facts, key facts in the case, began several years before. But through the course of time, we've taken an immense number of depositions. We have found audio tapes, videotapes, surveillance tapes, a lot of evidence for you to review towards proving these allegations. The core claims, again, are medical malpractice, which is that the defendants failed to meet the standard of care, and we will prove that through expert witnesses, that they failed to identify CRPS, which is also known, by the way, as RSD, it's the older name, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, now known as CRPS, okay? They failed to identify it at first, and then they misdiagnosed it. And then once misdiagnosing it and realizing they misdiagnosed it, the evidence will prove they went about a system to try to get the Kowalskis to admit they were right. Battery, I talked about. False imprisonment of Maya on multiple occasions. Intentional infliction of emotional distress is where you do things so outrageous that they cause damage and injury to a person. In this case, a suicide. In this case, traumatic disorders, depression, a multitude of emotional problems and issues. We've alleged fraud in that they intentionally deceived or attempted to deceive in the proof of the matter. We also alleged fraud in that they billed $536,000 for the treatment of CRPS and yet never treated her for CRPS and took multiple p p positions, especially to them, especially to Maya, that she did not have CRPS. Yet they billed over half a million dollars to the health care provider and the Kowalskis for the treatment of it. Beata Kowalski was born in 1973 in communist Poland. Uh, you may recall that the uh, Berlin Wall came down in 1988, and in 1990, within a couple of years, she was able to escape Poland at the age of 17 and come to the United States. She also all, uh, had a couple of relatives here already, so she made it over, stayed with relatives in Chicago, and got her AA in nursing, and then her BS in nursing, and then added to it two or three other specializations. Uh, and then uh, eventually, and we'll go to this in a moment, ended up an infusion nurse. Jack Kowalski was born in 1961. At the time all this went down, so Maya, let's see, Beata would have been 44 and would have been 50 today. Jack is 62 at this point. Jack was born and raised in Chicago. He's a firefighter and paramedic for over 28 years. Uh, rose to deputy chief, uh, one of the Chicago fire departments. He uh, donated time during the post 9-11 recovery to help. He also do, uh, worked during hu Hurricane Katrina during the recovery effort. And we'll have some video, I think, about several saves Jack made, one in uh, rather dramatic of a wall collapsing right after he got some people out of the building. Um, for 9-11, he designed a license plate for 9-11 firefighters, the loss, uh, that's, I think, still in use. And he insists on distilling what he further insists on calling wine, which you will not have to try through the course of this case. That was a joke. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, it's just not. So, Jack and Beata met in Chicago, and they were married on a uh, 
cruise in Jamaica in 2004 with friends. Um, Beata became stepmother to Jack's daughter Corrine by prior marriage. Um, they were married, like I say, in 2004. They got along tremendously. There was uh, a lot of mutual interest, one of them scuba diving. Uh, Jack was, a, as we say, a firefighter. Beata was a well-trained nurse work, working for Loyola University Medical Center in the ca uh, cardiac catheter lab. Maya was born in 2005. Uh, Beata became, began working for CVS Corum as an in-home infusion nurse, which gave her a little more flexibility in terms of raising a family. And then Kyle was born in 2007. Interesting story there. Uh, Kyle was born with thrombocytopedia, which is low blood platelets. And because uh, they needed blood, Beata's blood specifically, but because she had just had a child, she could not give the blood. Beata got up, checked herself out, went to a uh, hospital down the street, gave the blood, collected the blood, came back to the hospital, <laughs> checked herself back in, and gave the uh, low platelet uh, combating blood to her, her baby son. Um, the couple moved to Florida in 2014. They already had uh, some family down here. One of Jack's brothers lived here, lives, uh, lived near them. And uh, Jack was able to retire after I think 25 years in the fire department. And Beata was able to transfer positions down to CVS Corum. And uh, she developed and had wonderful patients throughout the area here. Uh, Jack started applying to uh, become a FEMA uh, representative using his experience as a firefighter. That plan, as we'll see, was interrupted by what happened here. Uh, Maya, growing up, a typical healthy kid, uh, she had some asthma and allergies, as a lot of children do, uh, but nothing that wasn't controlled with the usual. She enjoyed ballet, gymnastics, uh, figure skating with her mom. I, it's a very big thing in Poland, fi figure skating. And so, uh, Beata spent a lot of time with Maya towards that. And then Maya and Kyle enjoyed fishing in the backyard. Now, Kyle uh, has majored in being skinny for most of his life, although we're finally seeing him put on a little bit of weight, loves fishing. Um, and the new house in Florida they had over in Stonewalk, is that right? Uh, has a pond out back, which is very handy. Now on July 3rd, 2015, and this is a photo of the July 4th party, Maya started to feel a little bad. She apparently twisted her ankle in a gymnastics accident, and or just from doing gymnastics, I guess. And then on the 4th, during all the festivities, Maya simply collapsed on the floor of the kitchen. And I think you'll hear uh, Uncle Bob, her uncle, say she made a noise that no human child should make. And almost immediately had extraordinary pain, which developed over the course of the next three or four days to the point where it was extremely difficult for her to even walk. This was completely mysterious to everyone. She also had extremely rough coughing fits, which we'll have some, I think, I know we'll have audio of, may have some video of too, so you can see where these came from. These were not, <laughs> these are from deep within. Um, she was taken to the ER, and then the initial diagnosis was allergic reaction, reactive airway disease. There were multiple theories, but Maya was not getting better. And on July 6th, she was her first inpatient admission to Johns Hopkins. Now, uh, at this point, Maya could barely walk. And she was brought in, testing done. Of course, the parents and her brother are going nuts because they cannot figure out what's going on with her. 
and she is complaining of being in extreme pain. And so Beata, the nurse, gave a full history of everything she knew to that point, which really wasn't much because it had only been a few days. Johns Hopkins really didn't have much of a diagnosis at that point, although they thought maybe some of the steroids that Maya took from her asthma might have been you know, the, causing some reaction. So, her first consult with Suzanne Jackman from Johns Hopkins uh, notes low cortisol level, muscle pain, and muscle weakness. Says the pain and weakness may be steroid induced myopathy. And by this point, Maya, by July 12th, was discharged in a wheelchair. So she came into Johns Hopkins the first time, uh, walking with difficulty, left in a wheelchair. And the diagnoses at that point were secondary to steroid use, generalized muscle weakness, habit, cough. Steroid myopathy uh, is interesting in this case because I think one of the issues may be about the amount of ketamine it all uh, eventually took to control Maya's pain. And something I think you're going to find is that steroids that she takes for her asthma actually have a component that breaks down ketamine pretty readily. We'll, we'll get into that a little further and have some experts talking about it. And, and Maya, like every victim of CRPS, had good days and bad days, but her legs continued to wither. The second admission was July 17th through the 20th, an inpatient admission, again, to Johns Hopkins. There's a history and a physical, uh, presents due to even more increased pain, now moving from her legs to her arms, her back, her stomach, her neck, and head. The differential diagnosis, myopathy, myositis, and now we start in with psychological pain conversion because they cannot figure out why this child has this degree of pain. In other words, no clue at this point. So as part of the uh, treatment, they, they suggest that Maya be taken somewhere else, TGH, Tampa General Hospital, for therapy. They thought maybe physical therapy would help the child. Uh, and as part of that transfer process, they sent Maya's history and physical notes to TGH, and then had a phone call informing them that they thought this might be conversion disorder, this might be mental. So the first time any of these other doctors heard anything about Maya Kowalski, it was with an initial possible diagnosis that it was all in her head. The child couldn't walk, and certain symptoms were coming to the forefront by this point. Now, John, now, because Johns Hopkins couldn't figure out what the heck was happening, Maya was taken by Jack and Beata back up to Lurie's Children's Hospital in Chicago. Now, this is her former home. It was a familiar place. Uh, Lurie's had treated Maya for this asthma previously. They thought, well, let's take him back and get a second opinion. And so, uh, and Johns Hopkins was aware that patients were going to seek a second opinion and contacted and talked to them about their theories. Um, the doctors in Chicago couldn't figure out what was going on either. So Jack and Beata proceeded with Johns Hopkins' recommendation to take him to Tampa General. Again, the doctors in Chicago thought, well, it could be steroid myopathy, it could be generalized muscle weakness, or maybe it's all in her head. But nobody made a diagnosis of that. She went to Tampa General Hospital, and TGH, as I said, already had Johns Hopkins records. Now keep this in mind, facts will show they already had the records, they already talked to them about what Johns Hopkins thought. All right, so Maya had inpatient comprehensive pediatric rehab and physical therapy and occupational therapy for the steroid myopathy. Now the reason this is important is that before, there are certain treatments that you get for CRPS before you start ramping up on some of the medicines that are used. So you wanna see if the most basic types of therapies can bring somebody around to lower it to the point where it's, it, it's livable. 
CRPS never goes away. It is a permanent disease. It's merely controlled. But before you graduate on to more advanced treatments, you want to go through the basics. And fortunately, uh, they had the idea of trying PT and OT, but they did not spot that it was CRPS either. They still went with Johns Hopkins theory, excuse me, that it was steroid myopathy and that maybe there might be some psychological overlay. Again, they missed it. Uh, she was uh, evaluated for adrenal insufficiency, uh, inpatient treatment for mood and disorder. She's given Valium and Prozac. Again, this is a nine-year-old girl, 10-year-old girl. Hospital uh, alluded to Maya or Beata falsifying or exaggerating a fall from her bed uh, and missed several complaints, uh, missed, although they documented, several indications of CRPS. However, at that point, she was there for four weeks, and as it, the discharge diagnosis says, history of steroid-induced uh, myopathy, noted as resolved by admission, gait disorder, impaired mobility, ADL, asthma, psychological factor affecting physical condition, conversion disorder versus factitious disorder versus others, anxiety disorder, myalgia. Now, importantly here, you'll see that it says resolved by admission. Well, we're going to bring in the actual physical therapist that treated her. And you will find throughout this case, the facts will show that there will be a distinct difference between what the actual people who were hands-on treating Maya had to say about how she was doing and whether she's progressing and what was put down in the medical records. The Tampa General Hospital visit was very difficult for her. At this point, she was displaying, uh, dis displaying what is known as dystonia. Dystonia is where the ligaments in your, it could be anywhere, but in this case, in her ankles and feet were contracting to the point where her feet were starting to turn in like this. This is a clear, clear indication of CRPS. Tampa General Hospital uh, thought that maybe they should put some boots on her and see if that would correct her feet turning in. And we'll have some video from the physical therapist that shows Maya attempting to walk in those boots, Maya attempting over and over again with things like trying to push her leg and saying, giddy up, horsey, again, remember, it's a nine-year-old girl, and demonstrating she was trying as hard as she could to walk. The evidence will show throughout this, Maya did not want to be in a wheelchair. She did not want to be one of the kids that was looking out the window while all the other kids were playing. But Maya kept getting worse, not better. And she was still in pain. And when school starts in 2017, uh, I'm sorry, 15, uh, she says she was still in pain throughout her body and she would moan and scream in time in panic and she kept getting weaker, weaker, and weaker. Now, Maya was in and out of Johns Hopkins throughout this period of time, okay? And there was prescriptions for opioids, again, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nothing was working, no one had any answers. And then a patient of Beata's, one of the infusion nurse patients, said, this may be CRPS, I have a, uh, a daughter with it, I believe. Why don't you look into seeing this? And there are doctors here in Tampa Bay area that can that are specialists in this. And, uh, and so she went to see Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick at the RSD Foundation, Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy Foundation. Now, to diagnose the Budapest, to diagnose complex regional pain syndrome, the Budapest criteria for CRPS gives us certain specific symptoms, diagnostic criteria, persistent burning in the arms, hands, legs, feet, or another part of the body, check. Multiple, multiple medical records will show she had that. Pain can be mild or severe. We have actual audio recordings of Maya moaning. You'll see and hear the child and can determine whether or not 
she was in pain. Swelling, sweating, all of those. Dramatic changes in skin color and, and uh, skin temperature. Testimony is that Maya was constantly too hot or too cold. Now, people get too hot and too cold all the time, but usually they're not nine or 10 year old children to the point where they're either shivering and need a blanket and then two hours later uh, are, are wondering why is it so hot in here? That kind of temperature change. And of course, then blurred vision, which is already appearing in the records, dystonia, Again, the movement disorder, disorder like this, and then a really confusing <laughs> symptom called aldenia, which is an extreme but often inexplicable sensitivity to touch. It means that on some occasions, you could come up and squeeze Maya's arm or touch her legs and get no reaction at all. And at other times, just the thought of someone coming up to her and putting their hand near her as though they were going to touch her would give off an incredible reaction, screaming, yelling, resistance to anyone even touching her. Reason? That because of the RSD, CRPS, she would feel extraordinary pain as a result. But it doesn't happen all the time, and it doesn't mean that when you don't have it, you're not in pain. One of the experts will testify that this is sort of like, think about it as a cancer patient or someone with an intermittent disease. You may be in remission, and be doing fine, and look fine to everybody outside. You may be hurting like crazy on the inside, but outside you look pretty good. And then other times you may be curled up in a fetal position and not be able to walk, talk, or move. Also a light sensitivity. Interestingly, the Budapest criteria, which are kind of the accepted criteria for CRPS, are also listed by Johns Hopkins as there. Diagnostic, diagnostic criteria for CRPS, right? So she goes and sees uh, Anthony Kirkpatrick, Dr. Kirkpatrick, who you'll uh, meet. Now, uh, notice on the photograph, see the feet there turned in? Notice the lack of muscle mass on the legs. Um, she's in a wheelchair, obviously, and that's sort of a attempted smile, but she's got sunglasses on. Now, why is the child wearing sunglasses inside at the doctor's office because she has a sensitivity to light caused by the CRPS. So Dr. Kirkpatrick went over the entire full history list of symptoms and therapies tried. He did objective testing including pain uh, threshold tests, range of motion tests. We'll actually have videos from before and after where you can see that before the treatments she eventually had and are part of the uh, issues in this case, she can barely get her hand, uh, arm up to here, and then you'll see after the therapies that they ultimately complained about that she can put her arm hand completely over the other side. And the diagnosis was CRPS. Now, Dr. Kirkpatrick did not say, all right, let's just go into some heavy uh, duty pain meds or anything else. Again, he said, let's try some physical therapy and what is known as warm water therapy, which is essentially where you use a very warm pool or bath or something and you do it in there to loosen up the muscles. A little different, but again, physical therapy. He did not recommend out of the box any sort of pain meds. That didn't work and that's when he introduced them to a revolutionary use of an old drug called ketamine and the ability to uh, break the chain. See, CRPS involves a problem in the pathways between the pain sensors in different parts of the body and the brain. Usually when someone injures themselves, you sprain a finger or something, out, it hurts like heck. But over time, right, it starts hurting less and less and less. And pretty soon after a while, you just kind of forget about it. That doesn't happen with CRPS. Because of a problem as yet not understood, which is why we don't have any cure, the pain relay, the, the circle, the loop here of feedback is getting bigger and bigger and bigger until what was once a tiny little fracture or a tiny little sprain or whatever you want to call it turns into something that is the worst pain known to medical science. I'll talk about that in a moment. And ketamine, which has been around since the 1950s, it's FDA approved, 
it's used mostly as an anesthetic. But, and, it, and it's not an opioid. It doesn't work like an opioid. But for some reason, I fully understood, it breaks this, this uh, feedback loop and people start getting better. Not all of them, but a very high percentage get better. So there's uh, actually, I think, do we have the audio on this? Uh, so this is one of the initial visits with Dr. Kirkpatrick discussing uh, the, the use of the ketamine infusions. And I want you to concentrate on what this, uh, this mom, who's also a nurse, is asking about. In your <coughs> administers the ketamine. I do. You do. Okay. Yeah. And I'm ACLS certified. Also, I have to be. To do yeah, kids. you have to be. Well, pals, you got to have mm -hmm. pals and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and we have a pediatric code card back there. You know, we have to do all that stuff if we're going to do. Good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That was my next they're, question. They're do you have a pediatric yeah. crash card? No, we have to. We have to. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's a standard of care. You mm -hmm. have to. Do. Now, Beata knew all about how to keep her daughter healthy, not this disease, but how to keep her daughter healthy and how to protect her daughter. And notice in there, one of the first things she asked about, is there an ACLS crash card? Are there all the different equipments that you might need, even during an infusion, because remember, she's an infusion nurse, in case anything could go wrong. Now, here's the McDill, McGill, excuse me, pain scale. This is interesting. I, I had no idea until, uh, until I reviewed this, but I'm oh, sorry. Uh, this right here, as you can see, this goes over, and this was developed in Australia. It's been around for a long, long time. It's adopted by about every hospital, every medical uh, association. And this describes the different pain levels according to description by patients and every other objective finding that, that one can make. And you'll see at the top that CRPS is the most painful. It was actually developed at the University of Montreal, Canada by Dr. Waslasko, I guess. And most of the clinical trials were, I believe, in Australia. Symptoms of CRPS, we've gone over those. It strikes mostly females in the population between the ages of 7 and 21. It is known for initial sy symptoms that are inexplicable. However, upon close review and a differential diagnosis to rule out other things and consider neurological disorders, this is one of them. And if you can identify a few of these symptoms, our experts will say CRPS should have been brought into the mix very quickly. That did not happen here. All right. so. From October 6th through 8th, she has her first ketamine infusion with Dr. Kirkpatrick, a follow-up. And the first infusion went well and helped to get Maya out of pain, and there was a lot of encouragement over that. He wasn't pushing for more ketamine. He's simply trying to instruct on a conservative approach, warm water therapy, let's try the ketamine again. They tried it again, and again, got some good relief, but not for very long, maybe for a week, 10 days but not what they were looking for, to bring this child back to being a normal kid, right? So, um, at this point, Dr. Kirkpatrick says, well, she might need more and frequent uh, of these infusions, so why don't you go over to Johns Hopkins and visit for a PICC line placement? And so, on uh, November 4th, she goes back to Johns Hopkins for a PICC line placement and the diagnosis over there, except it is CRPS. And so Johns Hopkins itself does the PICC line. PICC line is a, a, it's basically a tube that's put in so you can do the infusions a lot easier without trying to find uh, a vein. All right, so, and she begins uh, therapy because, again, everybody wants to find out, is this really anything exaggerated by Maya? Is there a psychological component to this? Uh, Let's just make sure. So Maya starts with a therapist by the name of Rebecca Johnson. Uh, and I believe you'll hear from Ms. Johnson or uh, uh, Michelle Rogers, who is her partner there, about those. Maya was never determined to have 
any type of conversion disorder or factitious disorder by any psychiatrist or psychologist, except that as part of CRPS, there can be certain symptoms of conversion, which is, how do you explain this? The feelings of pain become so exaggerated, this allodynia, that the patient is anticipating pain before it actually happens. So she goes and has the therapy, but still nothing is working and nothing is really getting her out of the extreme pain on a long-term uh, basis. So Dr. Kirkpatrick, and you'll hear from Dr. Kirkpatrick here to explain all of this. Unfortunately, in the United States, the procedure that would had been shown to work the best for intractable CRPS, long-term ketamine infusion under general anesthesia, a medical coma for four, three, four, five days is not performed in the United States. It's performed in Germany. It's performed in Mexico. It had been around since approximately the 1990s. It had essentially 100% rate of safety, that is, no one had ever died from it, and it had a very high rate of success. There is a, a physician, a University of Texas trained uh, uh, anesthesiologist, Dr. Fernando Cantu, who is going to fly here from Mexico uh, to describe the process, and it involves, again, uh, infusions of ketamine over a very long period of time, the idea being that it causes the brain to reset so that you don't have this feedback loop causing the pain. The first one uh, in late November 19th through the 23rd, there is a uh, high dose infusion and what do you know, the lesions begin to heal and there's a slight less turning out of the feet and yet the pain was still not where they wanted it. So Maya stayed there, and then on November 19th through the 23rd, she went through another high-dose ketamine infusion. Now, during this period of time, other, other than during the middle of the infusion process, there were absolutely no negative signs from Maya. She had a brief increase in her liver function results, but only we're talking for a matter of hours. And as soon as the ketamine infusion was done, they went right back. And it's important to note that other than at that time, and through all of her ketamine treatments, Maya's liver functions, which is the things you look at if you've got a medication like this and you want to see, is it hurting somebody? You look at the liver functions, and her liver functions have stayed normal throughout. And you'll see the medical records to show that. All right, so then, a miracle. By December 28th, Maya's lesions are noticeably less. Her feet are starting to not be as turned out. In fact, by the end of January, and we'll show you the films, she's actually able to get back in the pool. You can see a picture of her here in, I believe, late uh, January, and this is her. You'll notice the feet looking better. She's on Kyle's shoulders there. You'll notice a real smile coming up. She's able to do her warm water therapy. But she still is having some pain. And the idea here was to get this kid out of the wheelchair, right? They wanted to get her out of the wheelchair. And to get her out of the wheelchair, they really needed to get the feet totally back and they needed to get the pain levels back so it wasn't so painful when she walked so she could build up her legs. That was the idea. So they go back to Johns Hopkins. Okay, all right, central port it means there's an operation and there's the note. Placement implanted central venous port. That's a tube under her arm to allow her to continue high level fusions. Not like Mexico, but uh, outpatient procedures. And she has a number of them through the course of the next nine months. Through the course of this, and with a doctor named Dr. Hanna, who Dr. Kirkpatrick recommended, Dr. Cantu recommended, because frankly, ketamine is incredibly expensive and it's not covered by health insurance. So uh, Dr. Hanna was set up to do these on a regular basis. 
Oh, yeah. I better get going. Okay, so Maya goes back to Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Anthony Kreisman, who had seen her before, a long term ketamine infusion, quote, ketamine coma, and he commented on how withdrawn and how much pain she's in. Listen to what he says on May 11th after about 30 of these infusions and the long term infusion. She is a completely different child from when last examined. By that I mean she is not in any pain, she is not moaning, she is smiling and interactive, she is very engaged. She moves spontaneously in her wheelchair without incurring pain. Through the course of that summer, because the ketamine is so expensive, they tried two other therapies. One's known as hyperbaric, you can see it right here, extreme high oxygen content, which has been known to help some CRPS patients. She also tries the uh, IVIG treatment to increase her immune system because it's believed that CRPS can be, uh, uh, the immune system may be part of CRPS. And by the end of the summer, she is almost back on her feet. This is in 2016, around August of 2016. Maya is almost back on her feet. We have video of her actually uh, using that as kind of a, a jungle gym to try to strengthen up her arms and her legs. Everyone is very excited. Everybody is looking forward to Maya getting on her feet. And then she has what they hope to be a minor relapse that turns into a fairly major relapse. And uh, on top, she goes back and has larger ketamine doses with Dr. Hanna on October 5 and 6. And she has some gastrointestinal problems and a lot of pain in the midsection. There are stories that you will hear about her screaming at night. She could not take the pain in her stomach anymore. At one point, the, pain, the screaming was so intense that the family got walkie-talkie, so the family could stay all the way over on this side of the house and Maya over here because no one could sleep. So they communicated by walkie-talkie. All right, so they decided on the 7th, October 7th, a key date, to take her to Johns Hopkins ER. Now, the reason was that we had Hurricane Matthew tracking up. If, you, uh, you know, if you've been in Florida long enough, the hurricanes start to blur together. I believe it's Hurricane Matthew who's tracking up the eastern seaboard here, getting winds like, I don't know, 35 to 50 miles an hour. Um, you know, to people from Florida, it's like, wake us up when it's a Cat 4. And, um, but to, you know, the Kowalskis were from Chicago and uh, had never experienced this before. They had visions of like the movie Twister going around in their head and so they, all of the ERs and everything were closed. So they took her up to St. Pete to the ER. And Maya is seen by five different doctors and groups of nurses and social workers from the ER and she comes in about 8.46 in the morning and she's crying and screaming and she's in a fetal position clutching her stomach and she is just out of her mind. And the ER doctors there start to react rather negatively to this. Beata comes in approximately two to three hours later and once again goes through the history, which Jack has been trying to relate, of all of the different visits to Johns Hopkins and all the different treatments and how everything has failed. And the only thing that has worked has been the long-term ketamine infusions and we can try this. Can we try that? Can we try a, a pump? Can we try, what can we do to get our daughter out of pain? For some reason, the doctors there either review all the past records and the some seven to eight to nine prior visits and the fact that she's had surgery there to have a port implanted to help her with the ketamine infusion. But for some reason, they decide that that isn't it at all. She really doesn't have CRPS. That the mom must be making all of this up. That this is, as a nurse, who we think is the one who actually made this diagnosis, Munchausen by proxy. Textbook Munchausen by proxy. Now imagine this is an ER, the child's back there, the parents pulling their hair out, trying to explain to the hospital, this is what Jack will testify to, and Beata's trying to explain to them in an ER where they've been about five times before exactly all the history that's going back that's already in their records, including records from the other hospital. 
Everything's there. For some reason, the doctors, nurses, and social workers ignore all of that and decide this is not CRPS, that this is the child is making it up and the parents are making it up and then this must be child abuse by the parents. Now the court has told you that there's pretty much a hair trigger on suspicions and so they make the call and that's not part of this case. You can make, you're supposed to make the call. Slightest, slightest different uh, suspicion you're supposed to make the call. So that's not a bad thing, whether it was right or not, at that moment. The case is about what happens after that and the failure to diagnose previously so that none has ever happened. Maya, they try to take Maya home after the first night, they're told that they need to observe the child overnight, fine. But by the second day, Maya is still in pain. They do knock her out with a lot of drugs uh, to get rid of the initial pain. And they give her ketamine. So the next day, she's much calmer. And so then they decide that Maya cannot go home. They decide that taking her home is AMA, against medical advice. And they say, if you try to take your daughter home, we're calling security. So the Kowalskis don't have much choice. They end up leaving. And the next thing they know, they're off to the races. On, and Maya is an unbelievable journey up through and including the death of Viata. Now, what you'll notice in the records, again, the records paint a glowing report of Maya. Just how great she's doing, how much she enjoys things. What a great stay she's having. She's getting this, she's getting that. The only thing she was getting to do was play the piano, Maya knows how to play the piano. She got to play the piano, and she got to draw pictures, and every once in a while she could send a letter. If she wanted to talk to her mom, it had to be on a supervised call. She could only see her dad and her brother on pre-arranged and monitored situations. If she wanted to see, they hired an attorney, obviously. If she wanted to see her attorney, the nurses, would demand that the door stay open. She never had a private moment with an attorney. They're Polish Roman Catholic, which is about as Roman Catholic as you can get, and have a very close relationship with their priest. So the priest went in to see Maya, and he will testify that when he arrived, he was told that he could not see Maya, and that she had had her religious artifacts taken away. We have a photograph of it. And he asked about this, and they said it's because we believe her mom is controlling her through religion. And so he was not allowed to see her that day, and it took a few other attempts, and then finally he was allowed in, but he was told no religious procedures. You come say hello, no religious procedures. I told you already about the 42 hours of being placed in a darkened room and told this is a new type of EEG, Maya. We're gonna, we're gonna really figure this out if this is in your mind or not. No, it wasn't, it was the surveillance room. And again, the goal, because these doctors had somehow gotten confused to think that CRPS includes paralysis. Paralysis is not part of CRPS at all, and yet, they were trying to prove that Maya could actually get out of bed, that she was faking it, that she was sitting in that wheelchair all the time, just, I don't know what reason, but she was faking all this. It actually, when nobody was watching, Maya was getting up out of that chair and walking around everywhere. So they put the commode just a little bit out of reach, right? Figuring, when she thinks nobody's watching, she'd get up, she had to go to the bathroom, go over there. 
Well, that didn't happen. And you'll see video of Maya having to be carried over to the commode. Of course, her skin started to show the lesions again. Maya started on a dive. Badly, badly getting worse. Depressed. The lesions are forming. You'll see them. Uh, yeah, here, uh, now they just may look like scratches here, but you can't see too much of the stuff on the back. What you'll notice through the series of photographs, and thank goodness, Dad here took photographs of Maya's lesions. And you'll see those photographs, and I want you to compare them to the medical records because you'll see on the dermatog dermatological reports, you'll see skin normal. And yet you'll have photographs from that day showing lesions. On January 6th, they decided that they needed photographs to prove that Maya really didn't have as many lesions as they said. So they brought someone else in, and we have better pictures. You can see a little bit of Maya's face there. They claim, oh, this didn't bother her at all. There was no authorization from the family, no notification to the family. Maya was screaming bloody murder not to do this because it hurt. They took off her clothes except for her training bra and her shorts, pulled down her shorts, pulled up her shorts there to take photographs of her. Now their testimony is, oh, this wasn't bad on her at all. She was fine with it. No, what she's told is if you don't let us take photographs, you're not going to see your mom. That's what they told her. So they end up taking photographs. And somehow, where are the photographs? We've only got a few. We do have photographs from the father at the time, however. So by this point, it's pretty bad. Let's talk just briefly about Beata. During this period of time, Beata is only allowed to talk to her daughter. Hopefully, we'll be able to play some of the tapes. We'll be able to hear Beata trying to talk to her daughter. But they put th certain things off limits, like, how are you doing? How is your treatment? How is your medication? Things like that. No, you can't talk about that. Not allowed to talk about that. They're the most mundane things in the you can imagine on these telephone calls. We are allowed to use them. And in those, you'll hear one of the social workers, Kathy Beatty, who was assigned Maya. Now, she was a social worker from one floor, but wherever Maya went, Kathy Beatty followed. And we have the trail of emails and notes leading from notification to the general counsel, through risk management, on down to one of the senior doctors, down to Beatty about doing this stuff, including what you just saw there in the photograph. We'll prove they knew it at the highest levels. Beata is going freaking nuts, the evidence will show. They find out that Beatty's had some disciplinary problems. They find out, kind of through the grapevine, how bad things are for Maya. They find out about the lesions. Now her feet are completely turned in. And Maya has become so weak, the CRPS has developed to the point where she can't sit up straight. Okay? Now, uh, on the evening of January 7th, Beata, they were going to a party, Jack and Kyle, we're going to a birthday party, I think. And Beata had been uh, not ask, acting herself at all for a number of days. And she didn't want to go to the birthday party. She didn't really want to go anywhere for a long time. <coughs> the only thing she did was go to work. She was withdrawn. She and Jack had been having screaming fights because Jack did not want her to be so absorbed in this. He was more of the Let's just try to get her out of there, work her out. And Beata was trying everything, legal, social, every possible way to get her child out, and her child was not coming out. And she found out through several sources the condition that Maya was in and what was happening to Maya. And on that evening, once they were out, she decided to take uh, some belts and put them together, go out to the garage, make a noose, put a stand below her feet to be able to reach it. She
you took an IV of saline solution and put the IV in her arm and left a cell phone with a note that said, retribution, retaliation, retaliation. out. And she left two suicide notes, which we'll try to bring before you, telling you about why she did it. It took probably about 22 minutes, according to pathologists, to strangle to death. She'd kick the stand out from under her. When Jack and Kyle got home, they thought that she was in sleeping in another room, which they did a lot, you know, because they, they weren't getting along, frankly. And so nobody did that. And then uh, Beata's brother was coming in that night. He came in and just went to sleep, got up the next morning, walked out into the garage, I guess looking for something. And at first he thought it was a Halloween direction, uh, Halloween uh, know, costume or something. And he looks closer and it's his sister. And he, of course, just completely screams out. And Jack comes in, sees his wife with Kyle right behind him. Kyle was, I don't know, we'll ask him how much he was able to see. Uh, 911 call made. You'll hear that. And uh, Beata is taken down. Uh, we'll have some, we're not going to get gross on them. We're not going to try to upset you too much on the photos, but we will show you some of the photos, right? Okay. Now, after that, Jack says, let my daughter go. If Beata is the big reason here, if she's the Munchausen by proxy, why keep Maya? No. No. It takes another week and a half, and Maya, let me get this straight. Maya's actually told in the hospital that her mom's dead. Johns Hopkins believes it's still in her head. And there's a text that goes around about how Maya's now better off because her mom's dead. Between two of the doctors you'll hear testify. Finally, after a lot of effort, Maya gets to go home. Now, I'm not sure if I got the photograph on this, but I'll show you a photograph. You can see on the ride home, she's, you know, she's got stuffed animals underneath her, and she's slumped over like this because she's so weak she can't keep herself up. Through the course, then, okay, all right, so, <laughs> the hospital will now come in and tell you just how great their therapies were. We'll show you the records, and they were not doing any therapies with Maya. They were warehousing the child. Maya gets home, and with her parents' care, oh, and one other thing, the hospital doesn't want any more use of ketamine ever again. And we'll get into the details of that. So just using the old, regular, and largely ineffective pain meds, this child manages uh, through warm water therapy and being home with support and love about eight months to get out of the wheelchair. Now, I, approach, I want you to compare that to the time after they first learned about how to use the ketamine, how fast it took to get her ready to roll, right? Out of pain. This child does it. In extreme pain. So she's on crutches here about the spring of August of 2017. Yeah, August of 2017. And it takes another year until Maya can walk unassisted. She's on crutches. One tough cookie, and we'll talk about just how tough she really is to be able to go through all this. Uh, Things go well for another couple of years, but in 2020, she has another bit of bad news about her schooling and has yet another relapse. This time, again, similar to the one in 2016, and similar if it was an emotional issue, the one right before she went into Johns Hopkins, when bad stuff happened. 
pretty much the same type of symptoms. And she ends up back in the hospital and she has to be put on a feeding tube because she's in so much pain she can't feed herself. So fortunately, after about a week and a half there, a week there, she was able uh, to get well enough to come out and uh, proceed on her way. And again, had to start over in some ways and was uh, able to rejoin a lot of her life. Without her mother, uh, Jack lost a wife, Kyle lost a mother, and the effects on the family are, well, you'll just have to listen to them to hear. Okay. So we're asking for damages for the physical injury, the overwhelming pain, not simply from the ketamine alone, but from the aggravation of the ketamine. Let me talk about this. Now, the, the, the CRPS started before Johns Hopkins ever got the fish, okay? But, but, the evidence from every doctor that's a specialist in it will tell you that it is vitally important during the first episode of CRPS that you properly manage it <coughs> in order to prevent an aggravation of the disease to the point where it's going to reappear and you will have longer, more frequent, and more devastating episodes down the road. The ketamine's nickname is the suicide disease. So the law is then that if you take a symptom, an illness, or an injury, and you aggravate it to the point where that person has a lot more pain, a lot more trouble with it, that unless some doctor can come in and identify the percentages back and forth, they're on the hook for the whole thing. All the ramifications. So now we've got long-term effects, and we're going to give you mortality tables so you'll be able to know how many years out. I'll give you some formulas on, on how to try to do this. I, I'm just an advisor. You ultimately will make all the decisions here, right? But I'll try to help with some formulas of how you can calculate such things. It's a difficult job. We talked about this in Guadir, right? All right. So we'll talk about each and every one of these. We'll talk about the physical injuries, We'll talk about, and Jack has, we, I haven't spent any time on Jack, but we'll get into that again on the testimony. Suffice to say, it's been devastating to not have his wife and the mother of his children. Kyle's lost a mom and the effects on him. So we'll talk about the pain and suffering, the mental anguish that you will carry around, they will carry around from not having a mother and knowing your mother killed herself for you. We'll have inconvenience. Now, you know, Beata was a nurse, so she could take care of herself, and she could take care of her family. She's not around. Loss of capacity to enjoy life. There's this thing called alhedonia, which means that you lose the ability to have pleasure out of things that once gave you pleasure. Maya tried figure skating. She won't do that anymore. Uh, Maya's not going back to gymnastics. Maya doesn't want to play piano anymore. The family doesn't want to go back to the church. And the family is having an extremely difficult time staying in the house, obviously. There's diminished earning capacity because what happens on your job if every you know, year or two or every six months you have this debilitating episode where you can't work and you can't explain how long it's going to be and whether you're going to be able to do anything at home or not. Uh, and like I talked about, the aggravation of the pre-existing symptoms and the illness. So then we ask you to consider punitive damages. Our argument is this, that <clears throat> these actions are so completely and utterly It's designed to deter, not only here, but in the future. 
and it's designed to punish, right? And so your decision there would be predicated on how much money does it take if we got to that point? What alters behavior of companies like that? So that's your job is to figure a little bit of, out about this, a lot about this. And so I, I was trying to figure out where the defense is going on this. Uh, I think it is that from their doctor's point of view, those doctors in the ER and the uh, hospitalists view uh, Beata was crazy and they thought she was going to try to hurt her daughter. They haven't explained like Maya did not come in with a bruise, a bump, a cut, a scrape, any bad uh, medical tests, no bad blood work. And yet they deduced from their discussions with her over the course of a few hours that it was actually her to blame. Uh, we will show you that up until this point, Periodically, through the latter probably 10 years of her life, Beata had had periods of anxiety, and she got treated with things like Xanax for that. And she had two periods of depression where she had some anti-depression <coughs> uh, uh, stuff, never long-term and all situational to events in her life. After January of 2016, and her daughter had been through this, she sought counseling and maintained counseling to try to get through what she was going through. We'll have Dr. Tashana Duncan come in. Circumstances about her, she's a PhD psychologist who uh, knew the story and did an intensive amount of research and she says there was nothing wrong with Beata whatsoever. And not a single psychiatrist or psychologist is gonna come in and tell you any different here. And we doubt you're going to hear anything from a psychologist or psychiatrist to say that Beata, that Maya was making any of this up or that she was suffering from factitious disorder or conversion disorder. We doubt, seriously, you'll hear that. And if the defense does come up with something, listen to my cross. They say that the amount of ketamine that the CRPS doctors were using, and the fact of the uh, ketamine, as they call it, the, the, the ketamine coma, it's, it's kind of, uh, in this case, that's their, that's their boogeyman, is the ketamine coma. You'll hear one of the doctors say that, that uh, that's the reason why they should be able to take Maya away from the parents, just because they didn't think that that was, uh, that, that that was met the Johns Hopkins standard of care. So because it didn't meet their idea of how to treat CRPS, their argument is that that justifies taking the child away. So what else? Uh, I think they're gonna try to say that because their medical records said CRPS here and there early on and then down the road, that they were justified for billing $536,000 for a disease that they vigorously deny she ever had and instead was always in her head. I think what they're going to say there is that, well, because some of the treatments we use can be used for CRPS, see, we could bill that. We have a memo, an internal memo, that says that they actually made a conscious decision to up their billing rate to CRPS because it's so much higher. See, CRPS takes a lot of effort to treat. You need occupational therapy, you need warm water therapy, you need physical therapy, you need psychological therapy, you've got a lot of different things that go into it. And so it's very expensive. But if you're just, evidence will show, warehousing a child while billing for CRPS, well. And you'll hear from the actual experts about ketamine infusions, why it takes so many and what you do to determine dosage. It's called titration. Maya had pre-existing treatment by a drug that broke down the ketamine. So for what us would feel like, you know, 
a Jimmy Buffett concert level of beers, to Maya we feel like two beers. And so that's kind of the relevance of, not a very good one, but the relevance of the ability of the, the steroids to break down the ketamine internally. Plus, you got to give more to kids than you do to adults. Plus, she was on this uh, medication for about uh, 14 months, and so there's tolerances. So the way the anesthesiologists do it, which is the way all anesthetic is done, is that you titrate up. You sp start on smaller doses virtually every time, and you increase until the patient has a therapeutic effect. In other words, take, taking them out of, of pain is having the right effect on them. There is no evidence anywhere that Maya Kowalski was ever in any danger. Maya Kowalski ever suffered any negative effect whatsoever. It is, the evidence will show it is all speculation on what could possibly happen. And I believe the defense will present themselves as the saviors of this family. You got 15 minutes left. Fine. 15. 15. Thank you. I may not even actually use it all. So, we'll lay it out. We'll bring in witnesses to tell you about CRPS. We'll tell you witnesses who spoke with Maya, uh, excuse me, Beata on her descent to the point where she felt the only way to get her child out of there the maternal instinct was to kill herself. Take herself out of the picture, daughter released. We'll present the experts on psychiatry, on ketamine, on the uh, use of it. On, we'll have the doctor flying up, the ketamine comas from Mexico. We will have psychiatrists who have studied this. We'll have the actual therapist at the time you may actually hear from some of the doctors from the outpatient part of Johns Hopkins and some of the people that were there at the time who have agreed to testify. So we'll do our very best and we'll try to introduce video and audio <coughs> and photographic evidence to document every single element of our case. So, have you, do I need Nick sort of serves as my walking um, laptop computer, reminding me of stuff when I forget it. <laughs> There's much to tell you. And you've been pretty patient here listening to all of this. It's an emotional place. What we will do is try to bring you together. What you do with it is up to you. I will put on the best evidence we can. I'll have a chance to talk to you at the end. Okay? Well, thank you. <laughs>